Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. My name is Atarut Aziz Inamini. I'm the director of the IBT slash ABC dash UTC. A very warm welcome to almost 950 sites that have registered to listen to our April 2024 monthly webinar live. Uh, we are delighted this month uh, a presentation on ultra performance concrete linked to slab design and construction by Jim Scarlata, uh, who is the assistant director of the Structures Bureau with the New York State Department of Transportation. Uh, during the registration process, we, we did uh, receive a number of the questions, and uh, Paul Lyles and uh, is going to be moderating the question and answer period after the presentation. But it is not late. If you have some additional questions, please, by all means, post it on the dashboard, and we'll try to get to them as time permitted. This webinar will uh, end uh, no later than 15 or 20 minutes after the hour, depending on the number of the questions that are coming in. So before I, before I uh, turn the uh, mic and the screen to our uh, uh, speaker, I'd like to share with you some very important and some very exciting actually news about the, our upcoming 2024 World uh, Bridge Engineering Conference. Uh, we have received actually a, a record number of the abstract, more than 100, almost 50 abstracts. Nevertheless, Many people contacted us. They wanted some additional time to uh, submit uh, abstracts. So we have extended the deadline to May 30. So there is almost an additional five weeks. So if you have uh, a good project, please consider submitting an abstract. There's going to be lots of, uh, they're going to have at least a five parallel session. So uh, there's going to be quite a number of presentations. Uh, these are the, uh, Again, we have a record number of the State Department of Transportation that have co-sponsored the conference. Federal Highway Administration and 33 state DOT have co-sponsored the conference. The conference topics, you can go to, uh, to the website and look at the conference topics. Basically, uh, this time, since we are related to the innovative bridge technologies, accelerated bridge construction, really we are covering uh, many, many topics related to the bridge engineering. We are very excited to tell you that we have uh, lined up a very exciting group of uh, uh, keynote speakers for the conference. Uh, our keynote speakers uh, is going to be Michael Knott, uh, Senior Vice President with Moffett, and his presentation is going to be what bridge designers should know about ships colliding with bridges and how to prevent them. We will have a keynote speaker from South Korea who is going to tell us the latest development in the automation and digitized highway bridge construction in South Korea. Um, Eugene Bruweiler uh, from Switzerland, uh, he's going to give a talk on, he's now a full-time consultant, he's going to give us uh, a number of examples on current developments in Europe in updating, retrofitting uh, bridges using the UHPC. I will be giving a talk on 3D printing with concrete. This is an area that is really just catching up. Um, Professor Mark Bensley, uh, who was, he was a, uh, MIT educated, is going to give a keynote talk on what is artificial intelligence and why should bridge engineers care? And last but not the least, uh, Ben Grable always have some exciting presentation in the store for us with the Federal Highway Administration, and his thoughts is going to be solution that move needle. There are travel scholarships that's available. These travel scholarships are only for the U.S. DOT engineers, county engineers, and the bridge engineers, the owner, bridge owners, basically in the U.S. There are opportunities, limited number of the exhibit boot, please go to our website, reserve your uh, exhibit boot before uh, 
it's coming. We are going to have some exciting award programs that we will be, we will be announcing them uh, during our next monthly webinar. Uh, it will include the Bridge Engineer of the Year Award, so uh, and also uh, award for the projects at different levels. So please spread the word. It's going to be an exciting uh, conference. Don't miss the opportunity. If you have a good project, submit the abstract and plan on being there. So at this point, I'm going to. Uh, turn it to Kathy to share with us some additional news. Kathy? Thank you, Torad. Um, I'm just going to share with you some of the upcoming events, both from some of our partner um, organizations and some of our own upcoming events, in addition to the World Bridge Conference, which I'm looking very forward to. First of all, the Engineer Society of Western Pennsylvania is presenting the International Bridge Conference, the IBC, um, from June 3rd to June 5th in San Antonio, Texas. You can see um, the, register, the site on the link for additional information. Next is the ACMA, the American Composite Manufacturing Association, will be presenting the Composite Sustainability Today Conference from June 4th to June 6th in Denver, Colorado. Again, see the link on the screen. The next event is the fourth International Bridge Seismic Workshop, which is August 11th through the 14th in Ottawa, Ontario. This is sponsored by the Canadian Association for Earthquake Engineering and Seismology and also Carleton University. Please note that the abstracts for this conference are due by April 30th. You can find more information both on the submission of abstracts and for registration at the link shown on the screen. Next is a news of note as opposed to an upcoming event. Our partners at the NSBA with the American Institute of Steel Construction National Steel Bridge Alliance ask that we um, let everyone know that there has been an update released for the bolted splice spreadsheet. They're at version 3.15 right now. Um, the link on the screen will take you to that updated um, release. That is a, a free right, resource available to um, everyone. If you do have additional questions about the bolted slice spreadsheet, you can contact Vin Bartuka at the email shown on the screen. Now to our own news. Next Friday, we have our quarterly research seminar. It's on Friday, April 26th from 1 to 2.15 Eastern. It's insights into the pull-off strength of polymer concrete and the effects of nanotechnology or the nano modifications. It will be presented by our partners at the University of Oklahoma. Registration is open now. Please register on the website. And now our next monthly webinar, which will be on Thursday, May the 16th, from 1 to 2.15 Eastern. We'll be hearing from Khaled Mahmoud, who will be presenting on the BTC method for the evaluation of in-place bridge cables. Um, a very interesting for um, owners in uh, areas that have lots of cable stay and cable suspension bridges. It will be a very interesting presentation on new innovations. Next, um, we're now announcing our in-depth web training. So the IBT ABC UTC presents an in-depth web training once a year. Now what this is, is it's similar to our monthly webinars, but we pick a topic and go into a lot greater detail. Um, as you can see, it's from 11 to 3.15, so we have a, a bigger amount of time in order to really get in-depth on, on these topics. So that is on September 10th. We ask that you mark your calendars for that. We'll be um, presenting six different modules on innovations in ultra high performance concrete. Over the next months, we will um, give you more details on that, the, mod the modules and the presenters, but please do mark your calendars. And that brings us to today's monthly webinar. We are joined today by Jim Scarlatta, who is the Assistant Director of the Structures Bureau at New York State Department of Transportation. 
Jim will be presenting today on ultra high performance concrete link slab design and construction. As a tour I'd mentioned at the beginning, um, we did have a, um, early question and answer or questions came in pre-webinar, but we do welcome additional questions during the presentation. So please do post any new questions in the dashboard question box. And I will now turn the presentation over to Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you happen to be. So today we're going to talk about ultra high performance concrete or UHPC uh, link slabs. So we'll get started here. So we'll give a quick rundown of what we're going to cover today. So first, we're going to talk about joint elimination, why you'd want to eliminate joints, and then um, you know, the current practices that we're using here at New York State DOT to do that. And then we'll focus on one joint elimination method, that is the UHPC link slabs. So what are they? Why you'd want to use one? And then how do they work? We'll briefly cover the evolution or the history of um, UHPC link slab, at least in New York State. Then we'll look at, you know, what makes a good candidate as far as existing bridges go for implementation of a link slab. Then we'll get into some of the construction and lessons learned. Then I have an example project. We'll finish with that. And then some uh, question and answer at the end. All right. Before I get to that, though, I wanted to share a really nice photo of the iconic Brooklyn Bridge here in New York State. Um, if you're ever traveling, the New York area, you're going to be near New York City, highly recommend that you take a walk across this bridge. Um, it's very interesting. It is a, a hybrid of a suspension uh, bridge with a cable stay. So you can kind of see the, the larger suspension cables that are draped over the towers. And if you look closely, you'll see kind of the cable stay. They're thinner cables that fan out from the towers. Um, this bridge was been around for a long time, was opened in 1883, and it connects Brooklyn to Manhattan. You can see the Manhattan skyline there in the background. And at the time, it was the longest suspension bridge, about 1,600 feet for the main span, and it's 125 feet or so above the East River. And then also a little diversion here, just wanted to give everyone an idea of our UHPC usage here in New York State. So these dots, different colors, um, represent the different years that a project was completed with UHPC. So you can see we have quite a few scattered throughout the state. Uh, we started with connections for prefabricated bridge elements. That was mainly precast deck panels. Uh, we also did some connections between um, you know, deck bolt tees and um, some other prefabricated bridge units, that sort of thing for accelerated construction. Then in 2013, we constructed our first UHPC link slab, which I'm gonna go into depth in a little bit here. Then 2019, we did some UHPC overlays. And then more recently, just a few years back, we did our first uh, UHPC beam and repair. All right, so we'll get into this here. So bridge deck joints. Why eliminate them? Well, get the reasons listed here. They're going to require frequent maintenance, um, especially if you're running snow plows frequently, like we do here in New York State. These joints are constantly getting ripped out by the plows and scattered across the roadway, so this is very hazardous to the traveling public. It's also a little bit of a nuisance to the public. You know, the the uh, the bump every time you go on and off a bridge. We can get rid of that. But the main reason is that joints leak. Um, we have a saying here in New York State DOT, we, have, we use two types of joints. We use joints that leak today and joints that are gonna leak tomorrow. So all joints are gonna leak at some point and that's gonna expose the underlying components to um, what I would call a trickle down deterioration where the, the chlorides attack the beam ends and then they work further down in diaphragms, your bearings, bearing stiffeners, 
your pedestals, and then eventually your substructures. So by limiting joints, we can significantly increase the service life of our bridges. So I've got two methods shown here to eliminate joints that we've used in the past. Uh, the first one here up top, this is um, this is method has kind of been around the longest. It's where we go in and we take two simply supported spans and we connect them together with bolted splices. Um, this method, you know, it, it works. The, the issues that we've had though are during construction. When these girders were originally fabricated, they weren't fabricated to be connected in this manner. And also the spans can shift slightly over time. So things aren't gonna line up like you'd expect or you'd want rather. And um, you know, sometimes you have to end up ordering custom plates once they get out there in the field, creating delays. And there's just a lot of uh, monkeying around to get those things to line up. So the second method here on the bottom of the screen show uh, basically we have same type of concept where we're going to make the simple spans continuous, you know, fully connect the beams and deck. But this time we're instead of uh, steel plates and bolts, we're going to cast a concrete end diaphragm. So we'll, you know, drill some holes through the web, send reinforcement through, form it up, and then pour the concrete. Now the issue um, with with both of these methods is that we're taking spans that were simply supported and we're turning them into con continuous spans. So that addition to con continuity brings on a number of issues, um, particularly from a design standpoint. So now we have, you know, we're introducing tension up into the deck as well as the top flange. So we're gonna have to add some negative moment reinforcement to the deck and that could extend out a ways into the span. We also may need to do some top flange strengthening because that flange was in very low stress state prior. And now we're introducing a lot of tension. So we may need to augment that plate. And same thing with the bottom flange, we're introducing compression there that wasn't there before. So we may need to uh, potentially add an additional row of diaphragms for buckling or um, increase the plate sizes. So our next method here shown on the top of the screen is a conversion to integral abutments. Now, we're huge fans of integral abutments. We try to use them wherever we can. And so this is, um, you know, kind of right up our alley. And what this kind of hard to see here, but this is the existing abutment here. You can see the pedestal, the outline of the pedestals. And this just gets a form thrown on the front and the back and we encase the beam ends and add some reinforcement, uh, drill and grout some vertical reinforcement into the stem and create a, convert this existing abutment into an integral. The issue with this method is though, it's, is it's very limited in its use. Um, because we're taking an existing abutment, creating an integral connection, we're now introducing the thermal movements of the superstructure into that abutment. Now you can get away with that, but only for shorter spans. Our rule of thumb is about 40 feet or so is the cutoff to where you, and you go above that length, um, the movements that, that occur from the superstructure are gonna overwhelm your existing abutment and create some issues. And then last but not least is UHPC link slabs. Um, you can see a photo there, they're pouring the link slab and then the final product. And we're gonna go into much further depth in the following slides on those. So real quick, um, you know, back to basics. So we have um, some diagrams here, moment and shear of a two span bridge. So on the left is without continuity. And you can see in red here, this is our positive moments for both spans. And then we have our shear in blue. Now, if we look to the right, this is what happens when you introduce continuity with some of those other um, joint elimination methods. So you actually reduce the positive moment, which is fine, but at, a, at the cost of introducing a negative moment, which the structure wasn't originally designed for. So that's one major drawback. And then also you can see as far as the, the shear or the reactions, we're actually gonna get about a 25% increase in live load reaction at the support. So if we had a foundation down here that was, uh, 
you know, just squeaking by in terms of capacity. Once we add that increased live load reaction, then we may have an issue with that. We may have to strengthen the foundation. So we can avoid all that by using a link slab because a link slab does not add continuity. So link slabs have become our preferred method for joint elimination. We find that they're very economical. They're gonna reduce the design time, uh, structural removal and reconstruction work. They avoid those undesirable negative moments that I've mentioned, as well as the increased live load uh, reaction at your interior supports. And as far as we can tell, based on our experience and a lot of the research out there, they're gonna offer a very long and maintenance-free service life. Uh, link slabs are also very versatile. Um, really, any, the vast majority of the bridges that we have, we found that we can use them on. So for super structure types, um, steel multi-girders, um, concrete beams, adjacent box beams or concrete slabs, um, trusses, arches, um, are just some of the types of the superstructures that link slabs can be used on. They also can accommodate a wide variety of geometry. So whether that's um, you know, narrow bridges, wide, short, long, uh, skewed, curved, um, flared or splayed or any of that, um, all link slabs can all be can used can be used on all those types of uh, configurations. All right. So what is a link slab? I have a, a three span elevation view an uh, elevation view of a three span bridge shown here uh, we're going to come back to this example a few times but essentially what a link slab is is the joints that that are at the interior supports or the piers um, they get removed and the deck is extended over where the joint used to be so that's a link slab in a nutshell and what that looks like during construction at least for UHPC link slab. First step, you're going to do a saw cut in the existing deck, about two feet out from the joint system, and then remove the rest of the deck end using chip hammer. Once the existing joint system is removed, you'll have something that looks like this. And you'll see here that we're going to retain the existing longitudinal reinforcement. That's gonna be used to anchor in the link slab later on. Next shot is the workers forming up to reconstruct the deck end. And they'll form this in such a way that they're going to leave a recess on top. And that's where the UHPC will be poured to complete the leak slab. And the final photo there on the right is showing that. You can see they're putting on the forms and, and filling that recess with UHPC. So the number one reason to use link slabs and why we started using them is for joint elimination to prevent things such as this. Um, we have some deteriorated pedestals with a bearing dangerously close to the edge, um, girder end deterioration that's gotten to the point that the girders are starting to buckle. And also this is the underside of a pier cap beam where all the, the main longitudinal reinforcement is corroded. So that's why we started using link slabs and that's the predominant reason why we use them today. However, since we've been using them, we've found some other uses, some other advantages. Um, first one I've got here is accelerated construction. Um, so with this, if, um, you know, for multi-span bridges, it can be much faster to erect a number of simple spans and avoid the need for multiple cranes and having to do bolted field splices in the air or um, having to close down traffic to do that. We can simply pick our beams, set them, and then come back and pour a link slab between the beams to eliminate um, any joints. Also works well with prefabricated bridge units. That's where you have uh, two girders with a deck already cast onto it that shows up on site. You can set those down and then you can use UHPC to connect your deck panels or the units together, and then also put a link slab at your supports. Another use that we found is they can be used to eliminate complex framing geometry. Now, when you have when you're trying to use continuous girders, and you're trying to keep these continuous girder lines 
over your supports when you have varying bridge width it can be very difficult you may end up with a very tight spacing in certain areas and then having to flare that out to a very large spacing and um, you know, very very complicated fabrication and geometry you can avoid all that just by having um, you know your individual spans the girders you know will not be continuous over the support so you can have five girders in one span and then you can jump up to eight girders in the next depending on your width and you can also um, you know vary your spacing and whatnot to complicate uh, or to accommodate geometry another thing that we found that can be used for is in situations where you may have uplift so if um, you know you had to locate one of your peers due to some site restraints you know very close to your abutment you know this end span may be subjected to uplift instead of um, using counterweights or tie downs or anything like that you can just you know, put a break in the girder here and use a link slab to avoid that uplift. Another thing that we've noticed as well is with all our continuous spans, we do get some cracking right over the pier. Uh, typically, it's one larger crack directly over the pier, and then about two feet out on each side, we'll have another slightly smaller crack, and then we may have another crack a few feet beyond that. Um, it's not a huge deal. The cracks aren't very large, but in the long run, um, you may have some some issues there as far as durability but we can avoid all that with a link slab and then the last thing here is reducing seismic vulnerability so with link slabs um, what can happen here is when you have these in the existing state when you have a bunch of simple span uh, we can combine that into one long segment where the seismic response is going to be uh, more controlled and also more predictable by our, our analytical software. And this is going to reduce the probability of an individual span falling off the support. And also when you when you introduce this large um, contiguous segment when you use link slabs, you have the opportunity to control and limit the amount of seismic force that's transferred from the superstructure to the substructure through the use of things like seismic isolation bearings. Um, and by varying the bearing stiffness. So you can get a much more controlled response and you can help direct those forces to substructures that can handle it. All right, so now we're gonna get into, um, kind of highlight the first job that we use the UHPC Lynx Lab on and then the evolution of Lynx Labs. So this is the, some before photos. You can see the joint on the left here. This is an armless joint that had been repaired a few times. And then if you look underneath at the pier, you can see a lot of evidence of leakage, uh, joint leakage, uh, and chloride intrusion, see the staining going on. Um, so in this project, rehabilitation project, we replaced the deck, precast deck panels. We put a link slab over the pier to eliminate the joint. Then we also did some substructure repairs. So here are the after photos. See the link slab on the left here. Maybe slightly hard to see, but this UHPC is slightly darker than the, the deck on either side. So that's the link slab up top. And if you look underneath at the pier, so this photo was taken six years after the link slab was installed. And you can see there's no evidence of uh, staining whatsoever. And um, what worked out nicely here is we, we happened to use a protective sealer on this pier that was a very bright white. So gave us a good contrast to see if there was any sort of leakage and uh, to date there has been none. So that has been excellent for us. Um, so that was our first job. Uh, this is an elevation view showing that it's a two span is actually slightly curved and we eliminated the joint at the pier with a link slab. Uh, after we did a couple other bridges uh, similar to that one and then we waited to evaluate the performance once everything checked out then we started using it more and the next type of bridges that we used it on was a very common bridge for us this is our, our typical overpass where we have some shorter approach spans some larger main spans that go over and that carry um, usually a freeway or highway over some local roads and these bridges again we were able to um, eliminate the joints and install link slabs at each of the piers and then more recently, 
our latest endeavor has been um, some long viaducts in New York City. Now with viaducts, um, we aren't able to eliminate all the joints, but we can eliminate a majority of them. So the color coding here is green is um, where a joint was and eliminated by a link slab. A yellow is girders that were that are already continuous, so there's no joint there to eliminate. And then the purple is the joints that are maintained. So what we're able to do here is eliminate many of the smaller joints and replace them with a few very large, um, in this case, it was modular, modular joints. So on this project, we were able to reduce the number of joints by 75%, which is going to greatly reduce the, the amount of maintenance needed um, to maintain all those joint seals. And also when we do have leakage, it's going to deteriorate uh, fewer substructures. So all benefits of, of link slabs. All right, so this chart is showing our link slab usage over the years. So we got a, a cumulative total here and then the year of letting. So as I mentioned, we started out, uh, we designed it in 2012, it was constructed in 2013. And we did a few more, then we waited to see the performance uh, once that uh, worked out as we expected and no leakage was found. And then we started ramping up the usage. Uh, these numbers um, don't reflect all the link slabs we have. We're still trying to get that into our inventory system for an accurate count, but this captures the majority. So you see we've got about 140 of them built and we got about 30 more coming down the pipeline. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about how the link slabs work. So showing here, uh, this is at a pier. So we have our, our two lines of bearings, we have our girder ends, we have a joint up top. And what happens here is when the spans are loaded, the girders are gonna rotate about the center of the bearing. And when that rotation occurs, the joint up top is going to open up slightly. So as live load comes on the bridge, the joint will open up a little bit. And then once the, the live load is removed from the bridge, the joint will go back to its original opening. Now what happens when you install a link slab is we're gonna force the point of rotation to occur up in the slab rather than down at the bearing. Then once we do that, we're gonna have a little bit of translation down here. So as the spans are loaded, the bottom flanges will come uh, closer to each other and then they'll move away as the load is removed. So we get this uh, repetitive movement of the bearings um, every time the bridge is loaded. And because of that, we're gonna wanna use a bearing that can take that sort of repetitive movement. And for us, that would be an elastomeric bearing. So that's the only type of bearings that we permit on link slabs. And also, I should mention that the link slab is a, a rigid element in terms of thermal movements and taking thermal movement. So it's not going to take any, any thermal movement. So that's another aspect to keep in mind and a reason why bearings uh, typically need to be replaced. But I'll get further into that um, uh, later on. All right, so for the design of the link slab itself, what we're going to assume is that the girders rotate and they're going to impart a, um, a bending moment at the end of the link slab. So we get a uniform uh, bending moment throughout the link slab, and we'll design the link slab to withstand that moment. So that's the link slab itself. Now, if we take a step back and look at the entire structure, um, what we do is we assume that the link slab uh, acts as a hinge. And this is a, a key distinction that um, you know, quite a few designers get mixed up on. Um, and the reason for this is when we look at the link slab itself, its own internal rigidity is such that, you know, it develops a moment within it and that moment needs to be designed for. But when we compare the, re the flexural rigidity of the link slab to the entire bridge, it becomes inconsequential and we can ignore it. So we end up with a hinged connection. So it's not gonna transfer any moment. The girders are gonna uh, rotate as they did before. So that simple span re 
behavior is retained. But any sort of thermal movement or a longitudinal load is going to be transferred from span to span. All right, here we have a comparison of the two different types of link slabs that we use in New York State. So shown up here is the conventional link slab. So this has been around for a while. It, well, I believe it was um, 1989 that this was developed, um, and it didn't really start getting used into the early 2000s. Um, but anyway, the way this works is you would go in, you're going to remove um, all the shear studs um, in the area near your support, and you're going to put down um, a bond breaker here, and then you're going to add additional studs in what's called the anchor zone. So we have our bonded zone in blue, anchor zones in red on each side. And then the idea here is that as the girders rotate, your deck up here or link slab will be able to accommodate those rotations by bending over a large distance. So without the debonded zone, all the bending would occur right over the support and you just end up with a really large crack. So introducing that slip plane we're able to distribute the strains more equally throughout and come up with um, a moment demand that can be designed for. But nonetheless, you're still going to have a fairly large moment and you're going to need a lot of longitudinal reinforcement up here. And also with conventional link slabs, they can be fairly lengthy. Um, it's about 10% 10, 10 of the span. And you'll need that sort of length to maintain your simple span behavior. So if these were 100 foot spans, we'd be looking at about 20 feet total for the link slab. Now we have the UHPC link slab. And as you can see, significantly shorter, uh, which is one of the main benefits. And we're able to do that by taking advantage of UHPC's advanced material properties. Um, so the way this works is we'll remove the deck end, we'll reconstruct the lower portion of the deck end with um, with either high performance or internal pure and concrete. Uh, it's the type of concrete that we use for our, our decks. And then on top of that will be the UHPC and we'll use uh, non-contact splices to connect the longitudinal rebar on UHPC to the existing rebar. And again, we have the same type of thing going on with our anchor zones. And then in the middle, we'll have our bonded zone. We'll place a bond breaker um, right below the UHPC. So the benefits of UHPC only require reconstruction the deck ends. So your construction area is very confined. Um, it also is gonna reduce your construction duration because of that. And one advantage in um, areas with lots of traffic volume is that you can do your re deck end reconstruction with nightly closures. And then it's, it's small enough that you're able to plate over it to run traffic in the day. And then if you can close the bridge for one weekend, you can go in and pour your UHPC and that will be ready for Monday morning traffic. Um, and then also another advantage is the durability and inherent ductility of UHPC. With its very low permeability, it's um, you know, steel fibers throughout to give it that tensile re resistance, uh, end up with a very durable uh, end product. This is a nice shot here. You can see this is a very thin slab of UHPC with no reinforcement beside the steel fiber. You can see how much that UHPC slab can deflect without any signs of, of visible, or at least any visible cracking. So the advantage of UHPC, it's very short, two or three feet long in most cases. Um, also, we can use a partial, partial thickness, partial depth slab. We, our standard is four inches thick. So because of this reduced thickness, it uh, adds more flexibility and requires uh, very little reinforcement. Um, and the reason that we can get away with such a short link slab is the ability of UHPC to strain and tension. So you can see here the ultimate tensile strain, 7,000 micro strain, very large number compared to your typical high performance concrete only comes in around 200. Uh, also, because of that steel fiber matrix, the steel fibers that's mixed throughout the UHPC, 
you get with a phenomenon that they call microcracking. So to accommodate the strain, what happens is instead of one really large crack forming where moisture and chlorides can get in, we have a bunch of very, very small cracks that are distributed throughout. So those cracks will be um, impermeable to any moisture and chloride ingress. Also, UHPC has a very high compressive strength. Um, our spec requires 18 KSI, so this can also be an advantage. Um, UHPC has a very strong bond to existing concrete. Um, of course, the, the surface prep has to be there for that to occur. And then we have the exceptional durability of UHPC. So now I'm going to get into the design of the Lynx Lab. So we have our allowables here. Um, we're going to do a, a flexural design where we're going to load both spans with HL93. And what's a little different here is we have a displacement based analysis. So typically, what you do is you compute your loads, then you compute your capacity or resistance, and then you make sure your loads don't exceed your capacity. In this case, we know the girder ends are going to rotate. We know that's going to displace the link slab and rotate the ends of the link slab. So we allow that to occur. Then we look at what sort of strain that imparts and then kind of work our way backwards into stresses. And we're also going to assume that these stresses are equally distributed throughout the bonded length. So we have a MathCAD sheet that does all this for you. Um, I have some basic inputs here, the reinforcement in the, the link slab, the length of the debonded zone. This is really is a key design parameter that, that you would adjust to get a design to your liking. Then we have our girder end rotations. And as I mentioned, this is a displacement-based analysis. So we're going to start with the strain. So we have the compressive strain in the UHPC that come up a certain distance to the neutral axis. Then we have the strain in our centrally located longitudinal reinforcement, and then the tensile strain up top. And we can look at that in stresses. We're going to assume elastic behavior and compression for UHPC, and then a plastic response due to the microcracking that occurs in tension. And we also have the stress in the reinforcement. So we're going to use a factored uh, girder end rotation for strength one. Then we're going to take that stress diagram and some forces for compression and tension. We'll set those equal to each other. And then in MathCAD, you can, they have a pretty handy equation solver where you can tell it C is equal to T and then solve for little c, which is the neutral axis, and it will spit out this long equation. So it's good to back check your results, make sure your tension equals your compression. And now this becomes an iterative process because we have more unknowns and equations. So we have to assume an initial strain in the UHPC. Then we get our neutral axis, then we back compute what the calculated strain is, and then adjust that strain, initial strain, until it converges with the calculated. And all that has been programmed into a small little programming loop within MathCAD. This basically starts with a very, very small strain and slowly iterates until it converges with the calculated. You can see here a neutral axis about an inch up from the bottom of the link slab, and that's a typical value. Once we know that, we can use stress strain relationships to get the tensile strain in the UHPC. We want to make sure that. At the top surface, we keep those cracks very tight and impermeable to moisture and chlorides. Then we want to make sure we don't yield the reinforcement that's in the middle of the link slab. And then we also want to look at the compressive stress at the underside of the link slab, make sure that doesn't exceed our allowable. All right, so that's the link slab itself. Now, if we kind of take a step back and look at the entire structure, we're going to see what happens when we remove a joint and replace the link slab. But before even doing that, we have to understand what the structural functions are of a joint. So it allows for unrestrained beam rotations. It's the simplest way to accommodate thermal movement. It's the movement of each span is taken up at the joint. And then it also simplifies the horizontal load distribution. So when we put in the link slab, we still have the unrestrained beam rotations. So that's great. We don't have to worry about any sort of continuity. But the link slab doesn't take thermal movements, so those are going to be altered. 
and we also have we no longer have those discrete segments so things get a little more complicated as far as horizontal load distribution to the substructures so back to our three span example you can see the existing bearings shown in black uh, this is a typical alternating fixed expansion and what happens when you install link slabs you're going to have now that you're not accommodating movement at each joint and also you're linking everything together typically you're going to want one substructure to be fixed and on shorter bridges that's going to be the the abutment on the low side so in this case we're fixing this end abutment then we're we're you know all the thermal movement that used to occur here gets pushed into span two and then the, the movement of span two that used to occur at this joint now gets accumulated in the span one so the movement of span two or span three two and one all ends up being pushed to the bin, begin abutment in this case and what we're going to want to do is take that a little bit further and put an approach slab here so that all the movement is off of the bridge uh, as seen at the top of the screen here so this is showing um, the conversion to semi-integral abutments this is the preferred option little more work and money but essentially what we're doing we're taking the deck and we're wrapping it around to protect the end of the bridge and we're doing that by um, creating a suspended back wall with the end plate that's welded on and some shear studs and then a approach slab that's rigidly connected to the superstructure so this approach slab will move and all the movement occurs at the abutment um, now um, if that option is is not attainable due to budget restraints uh, we can use what we call our jointless details so this is where the superstructure slab comes in there's a low friction material here so it slides over the top of the back wall and again the movement is taken off the bridge so some scoping considerations if you're looking to use link slabs you want a deck that's in that's in decent shape you wouldn't want to go through all this hassle and expense to just come back and replace the deck uh, precast deck panels. Um, we require UHPC connections for the haunch as well as between the panels themselves. So we already have UHPC on the job. And we'll just use a little extra to pour a link slab above it. Um, no skew or slight skew, skew will make your life and life easier. Uh, weekend closure, as I mentioned before, that's ideal. You can plate over the reconstruction work and then pour the link slab in one weekend we won't have to get into staging or anything like that and then as I mentioned as well you're gonna have, most likely you have to replace your bearings so if you have bearings that are deteriorated or unstable it kind of gives you the opportunity to address that issue as as well as uh, eliminate the joints all right some obstacles um, highly skewed supports um, it can be done um, and there's really no issue with the link slab itself what it comes down to is the bearing layout because we require elastomeric bearings it was a typically have a larger footprint than the existing so fitting those on the existing bridge seat can be a challenge and then also you know you kind of get the horizontal load distribution and acting about multiple axes on the substructure that can be a little complicated um, in a very rare situation we have a, not too many bridges like this but the fascia girders taller then the interior and the railings mounted up top. So we have this curb that comes down. Um, so for a link slab to work properly, it need, it can't have any large steps. So we couldn't take the link slab and then come up along the curb because that would create a very rigid area and it wouldn't allow the link slab to flex as designed. So that type of situation, we wouldn't use a link slab. Also post-tension decks, um, you know, this is where the joint is currently and you have the anchorage here so that just can get in the way of um, installing a link slab also with a pin and hanger got a few slides on that so for pin and hangers um, at least on paper we're finding that they increase uh, the tension in the pin and hanger system uh, these these um, details are, are scary enough on their own they, they tend to corrode and, and seize up and crack and whatnot so can avoid any tension we will so 
wouldn't recommend installing a link slab over a pin and hanger. What you can do is install a sling retrofit. Your vulnerability is removed, but you still have the joint. So it's more or less the Band-Aid. Um, remove the immediate safety concern, but you're still going to get deterioration. Now, one thing that you can do and that we're looking into, we haven't done it yet, is to do um, what the mass dot calls a shiplap detail. Essentially, you come in, you'll remove the girder ends, install new DAP girder ends, and create basically an in-span bridge seat where we can put an elastomeric bearing, put a link slab up top, and that would work very well. All right, now some construction and lessons learned. So because we're replacing the bearings and we're taking a lot of spans that had fixed bearings and putting expansion bearings, we create this interim condition where the link slabs um, are not installed yet and we have spans with all expansion bearings, so things can shift around. So we learned that the hard way and this happened. Um, but to address that now, we have some notes where we tell the contractor they have to prevent the movement and they'll typically install some wood blocks between the, the end stiffeners and, and clamp things together. And also, even with that in place, you still, before you pour the link slab, you wanna get underneath and make sure that your bearings are aligned properly and your, your spans are also not misaligned. So with the UHPC, it's very viscous. It flows through very small openings, so you won't gonna want sealed form work. Uh, surface preparation is very important. You want either exposed aggregate for new concrete or a roughened chip hammer surface with existing. You're going to need saturated surface dry for moisture on the surface. Uh, distribution of steel fibers, I'll cover that in the next slide. Also, the flow of UHPC, um, you don't want it to flow too far because what happens is the fibers will align in the direction of flow. And that's you don't want that to. You know, if you want to have all your assumptions with UHPC, your design assumptions, so you need those fibers to be uh, multi-directional. And also the very top surface of UHPC typically has some um, air bubbles that rise to the surface and also steel fibers may settle a little bit. So you're going to want to eliminate, um, overfill the cavity and grind it down. Distribution of steel fibers. Uh, this wasn't a link slab project, but we had an issue where the, the fibers balled up. So we had a lot of fibers in one area. We were lacking fibers in another. That resulted in some transverse cracking. And also, we had the UHPC pull away from the deck panel in this case. So we want to make sure the fibers are evenly distributed. Um, we do maturity testing to assess the compressive strength when we can open. And remove forms. You want to diamond grind and groove it. Remove the bad concrete on top and provide hydroplaning resistance. In the rare case that you do get some cracking on the surface of the UHPC, uh, recommend that you seal that up with high molecular faculty. All right, so I am running long on time. Um, I did not get to my example project. But it will be in the slides, and uh, anyone wants to contact me afterwards, I, I can go over that. So with that, um, just give some quick resources here. So FHWA has a number of documents. They have this bridge preservation document where link slabs are one of three preservation solutions. It also has overlays and beam end repair. And they have a um, link slab design example. Um, and this, they borrowed a lot of... Uh, our material for that and then the last one here is this is um a, a comprehensive guide for uhpc so this is going to include uhpc beams and whatnot for the whole gamut and then for new york state dot in the near future on our website we're going to have our, our policies guidance mascot worksheet and examples and details and in the meantime most of our information is on our design build website and if you're interested uh, suggest you email me and I can give you specific links and, and page numbers so you don't have to go hunting through all that. And with that, um, I thank everyone for your time and attention. And, uh, I believe we can take some questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rick. Great presentation. So uh, 
this is going to be an exception. We are going to go 25 minutes after the hour because I noticed that there are many questions that are coming in. Uh, we understand that some of you have uh, other engagement, but the recording of this uh, webinar will be uh, on our website. So in case that you don't get a chance to stay with us um, until uh, 25 minutes after the hour, you can uh, you can see the basically the the recording. So, Paul, at this point, I'm going to turn it to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tori. And Jim, and thank Rick, you. Rick, can you turn your camera on, please? Too? Yeah. Sure. All right, Jim. Really, uh, really good. There's a lot of questions that have come in, and we'll just uh, get right to them. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the design questions. Uh, these came in uh, earlier, but we have a whole bunch more. I'll be working those in with it. Uh, the first one I have is, what is your recommended approach for new construction? And is UHBC a preferred solution only for retrofit use? Um, so we predominantly use it for joint elimination on existing bridges, but there have been situations where we have used um, UHBC on uh, on new bridges, or if we're replacing a deck, um, we have used UHPC Lynx Labs. Uh, that's typically because maybe we're using UHPC for stage construction, closure pours, or that sort of thing. So it's really, um, you know, you have to look at the economics of it. UHPC is a very expensive material, and you, you have to use it strategically, and, you know, just where it makes sense. Okay. Uh, and then if you did have that, would you comment on any detailing or design differences between using link slabs for rehab versus using them in new construction? Uh, no, the, the, there would be no difference. The design approach is the same. Um, yeah, it, it would be the same. Okay. And uh, when you do the link slabs, uh, are they uh, fully or partially continuous for live load? Well, the the idea is that they're they're not continuous for live load. Um, we want to provide enough flexibility in the link slab so that any sort of resistance to bending is negligible, and so that's that's the way they're detailed to provide um, no continuity. With with the hinge, you said. Right. We, we, yeah, yeah. We assume that they act as a hinge. Okay. And then uh, several times you had pictures that do you have to modify your diaphragms at all? Your end diaphragms uh, when you have a, a link slab installed? Uh, typically, no. Um, you can reconstruct the deck end so that it haunches down and rests on the end diaphragm. And that's what we typically do. We kind of mimic the existing haunch down detail, but you don't necessarily have to. You no longer have a free edge at the deck because you're putting that link slab over the top. So, you know, if we're using like precast deck panels, um, we won't have that that haunch down and support of the end of the slab by the end diaphragm. So we can use a just a normal diaphragm with precast deck panels. It makes the, the detailing much simpler. Okay, and then when you were Getting out toward the edge of the bridge, if you have your wing wall, or the person said ballast walls, do you ever have any problem interfering with that? No, no. the The link slab would just end right where at, at you know where your deck ends, right at the the face of the deck. Okay. And what about this one came in uh, uh, recently? Uh, what about if you have a sidewalk? What do you do there? Do you uh, uh, raise the link, link slab to match up the sidewalk, or do you? What do you do? That, that's a great question. Um, initially, we like barriers and sidewalks. We would just pour it right over the link slab, and we found that they crack. Um, so what we do now is we try to debond the link slab from the barrier or sidewalk so we'll put a bond breaker on top of the link slab 
We'll also any reinforcement that passes through the link slab into the sidewalk, we'll the bond a certain length of that. And then we'll put a half inch joint uh, centered over the link slab in the sidewalk itself so that we're kind of isolating the two and we'll allow the link slab to, to strain as it was designed. And then the sidewalk above you know, will be debonded from that so it won't experience those strains. And then it will also relieve itself with that, that small joint. Okay. And this question came in during your presentation, but you were talking about the debonding agents. The question was, is waterproofing need, un, needed underneath the, the link slab or the joint? And if yes, is there any uh, compatibility issues? Um, no, no waterproofing is needed um, as long as the link slab is designed properly and you don't get an in, and constructed properly and you have good bond to the adjoining concrete and you're not overstressing your or overstraining, I should say, your link slab, you won't have any leakage. Okay. Um, and then as you're talking about the continuity, uh, this question came in during your presentation about uh, how do you ensure continuity of the reinforcement between the link slabs and the old slab? And do you rely on adhesion at all? Or are you just talking about bond with the rebar? Well, our detail is, is set up for both. Um, we have, we kind of key in the bottom of the UHPC into the existing deck. So we get some mechanical interlock, and then we also we're creating non-contact splices between the existing longitudinal rebar in the deck and the new rebar in the link slab. Okay. Um, then um, can link slab designs be applied to a, a series of like flat slab uh, concrete bridges? Say like you get a series of 30 foot uniform depth spans. Could you just do a whole lot of link slabs? Is that okay? Would that be all right? Yeah, yeah, that, that will definitely work. Um, you know, the detailing and getting the link slabs in and everything should be pretty straightforward. Um, but just like any other bridge, the, the thing you're going to run into is, you know, link slab doesn't accommodate thermal movement. So how are you going to take that movement? And, you know, what, what's going to happen to your substructures and, and that sort of thing? Okay. Um, could you use link slabs for longitudinal joints? I believe you could. Um, that's an idea that we've kicked around on a few projects. Um, got fairly far with it, and then uh, some, some things changed on the project, unrelated, and we didn't end up using it. But yeah, there definitely is the potential to you know, eliminate a longitudinal joint with a, a longitudinal link slab. Okay. Um, are there additional considerations for using UHPC link slabs in post-tension bridge deck slabs? Um, the only things I can think of is, is what I mentioned in the presentation where, you know, you just have to look out for any interference with um, the anchorages and and your tendons. But besides that, um, if you can get it in there, it, it should work fine. Okay. Uh, this one came in beforehand. Are there uh, any additional considerations for using UHPC Lynx Labs? Uh, excuse me, let me, uh, what considerations need to be taken into account when evaluating this technology on deck trusses? trusses um i don't really know if there's anything additional i mean again it's the the complicated aspect is always your bearing arrangement distribution of, of you know how you're altering your distribution of horizontal loads and then accommodating the thermal movement so it, it, would, it would be no different with the with the deck truss okay uh your question we had several questions about the rotations and it said, uh, this was beforehand, how are rotations being handled by the UHPC link slabs? You kind of showed that, I think, on slide 18, where you showed the, the rotation being at, uh, 
the top of the thing and then later on down at the bottom once you had done the link slab. Do you want to add anything to that or is that pretty pretty well covered? Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. You're just, you have that link slab and your girders rotate and you know your link slab flexes to accommodate that rotation. Um, as far as getting the girder end rotations, um, that's pretty straightforward. You can use line girder analysis um, or more rigorous analysis. Really doesn't make much of a difference. Um, so whatever you have on hand for load rating or what you're doing with design, um, you can just use those rotations and apply that rotation to the ends of the link slab. Okay, and then on that rotation, uh, you mentioned that you you used uh, uh, elastomeric bearings. And if you have uh, just steel bearings or whatever, do you go and replace those to, to get your, when you're doing the link, link slab? To, with the with elastomeric bearing? Yeah, we would replace those because any sort of bearing that relies on like a slip plane to take the thermal movement, that we, we fear that because we're introducing you know, we're locking the slab together up top. We got the translation happening at the bottom. You know, the, the bearings move slightly every time the bridge is loaded. We fear that that repetitive motion will prematurely wear out any sort of, of sliding plane um, that, you know, or a bearing that uses a, a sliding plane to accommodate movement. So yeah, we would, we always go with the elastomeric bearings. And, and sometimes it's rare, but sometimes we'll, we'll, the bridge will already have elastomeric bearings and the fixity you know will be adequate for when we install link slabs but that's pretty rare typically we're replacing all the bearings okay um is there any requirement for the length of the debonded link slab yes that is that's your main design parameter um so yeah, that's that's a value that's designed, and you know it can range anywhere from a foot to I want to say I've seen maybe like 20 inches would be the longest I've seen. But yeah, that, that's a key design parameter, and you know the the longer you make your the bonded length, the the greater distribution of strain that you'll get. So if you have a really high girder end rotation, to accommodate that large amount of rotation, you're going to need a longer the bonded length okay um we had a question here um how do you handle stage construction if you're doing the link slab <laughs> yeah stage construction that, that's a tricky one um we've done it a number of times um but it all depends how you can sequence things but a lot of the times what you end up with is we end up having to use temporary links because the link slab drastically changes the behavior you know you go from rotating at the bearing to up in the slab that rotation really isn't compatible with each other at the same support so you can't really have half the bridge rotating at the bearings and then half at the link slab you create a tremendous amount of tension in the link slab you know right at the stage line so yeah staging is complicated um we have some stuff in our in our policy that's coming out soon to address that, and yeah, you're gonna either have to sequence it very carefully, or you're gonna have to install temporary links. That's just a, a link that's that's temporary. Between, it connects the two girders, and then a lot of times you can detail that so that you can just cast it into your link slab and not have to remove it. Okay. Okay. Um, once again, we'll go. <laughs> Go back to the abutments. Uh, in, can you you showed a picture where you you put the link slab and you you put the joint back at the end of the approach slab. I guess the question had come up early on about couldn't you use a UHP link slab at the abutment side? I think you can. Is that correct? Yes, you can. Um, we haven't done that yet. There's there was a couple projects where it almost happened, um, but some other things changed. So. Yeah, it's certainly possible to do that, and um, that's something that yeah that we will do uh, eventually when when the situation calls for it. 
Okay, a uh, question came in during the presentation about, you showed a slide uh, where you replaced joints in the viaduct structure up to 826 feet. Is, was how do you control the ther total thermal movement? And I think you mentioned that you put a, 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 a modular joint in there. Is that what you said? I think you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yep, we would use, we'd fix a pier kind of in the center of that segment and then expand outward from the center. And then on each end, there would be a large modular joint. I want to say we had like four cell modular joints at some of those some of those locations. Okay. And then the other part is do you use one bearing type or use higher movement bearings at the ends? That's a good question. Yeah, so we in those situations with the longer segment lengths, yeah, the bearings in the center would be our normal elastomeric bearings and then the bearings on the the further piers that are going to experience the most movement, we would use it's an elastomeric bearing, but it has a, a sliding surface on top. So that's a polished stainless steel with Teflon. Um, and the idea is that still works with the link slab because the when the when the girders rotate and the bottom flanges translate, that amount of movement isn't sufficient or it doesn't generate enough force to break the friction. So you know for girder rotations, the elastomer is going to give and accommodate that small amount of translation. But when the thermal movements come in, that's when the slip plane will slip and then the thermal movements will be uh, relieved. Okay. Do you have any feel for how much movement you could eventually take? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the, the 800 something feet, that was, that was a big push for us. That was, you know, pretty far outside the box. Um, we're going to kind of, we'll, we'll stick with that sort of limit for now and, and you know, make sure that's performing um, adequately. But yeah, there really, there really is no limit. It's just a matter of accommodating that movement in the bearings. Um, you know, at some point you may need additional bearing stiffeners as, as your beam moves across the bearing. Um, but yeah, it's accommodating in the bearings and then also with the joint system itself. Okay. Uh, here's the one that came in during your presentation. It says, uh, why is the rotation center moved from the bearing to the link slab? I think you kind of explained that, but it says, does the introduction of UHPC link slab change the thermal point of no movement? And in other words, would a bridge with UHPC link slabs be evaluated as a continuous bridge for thermal loading and other superimposed deformations such as shrinkage? Yeah, if I understand the correct the question correctly, yes, it would. So your bridge, when you put in the UHPC link slab, basically just putting that link slab in itself, you add that rigidity up top, it forces the point of rotation to move up. Um, and then, you know, what you can think of it as once you have the link slab in place, for vertical loads, the bridge is going to behave as if it wasn't continuous. But then if you're looking at you know, longitudinal loads and thermal movements and shrinkage and that sort of thing, then it's going to behave as a, a continuous bridge would. Okay. A couple questions on UHPC. Is the New York DOT specifying proprietary UHPC mixes or do they have their own UHPC mix? No, we have a, a non proprietary spec. Uh, it's a performance spec. Um, you know, any, any company can get on it. Is, on our proof list as long as they can you know pass the physical testing that we do on their specimens okay uh what are the compressive and uh shear strengths of the uhbc for compression um, our spec requires 18 um, you can get higher than that and much higher than that if you're in a controlled environment uh, as far as shear that's something um yeah, I don't have that number on the top of my head. Okay. Uh, any special curing regimen required during the winter? During the winter? Um, we haven't done much UHPC in the winter. It would just be, you know, insulation and maintaining temperature, um, just like you would with normal concrete. 
the biggest thing with UHPC is the water to cement ratio is so low that you need to prevent any moisture from escaping. So we require, you know, top forms that are sealed down with moisture barrier um, and all that's to, to prevent any uh, moisture loss from the UHPC. Okay. Uh, what's the curing time for the UHPC? Um, and like anything, it varies depending on temperature outside and, and the specific mix design. But um, I guess a good rule of thumb is we've we've gotten um, 10 ksi in about 12 hours. That's kind of a typical number, and that's the the number that we um, can remove the forms. And then shortly after that, we'll have 10, 12 KSI, and then uh, that will allow us to open up the traffic. But I, I've seen some tests where they had 12 KSI in, um, I want to say, like seven or eight hours. But th that's not normal. That was kind of a, the extreme case. Okay. Um, have you had any issues with uh, QC testing on the UHPC? Um. No, no, we haven't had any issues with the testing itself. Um, I mean, we have had a few a few instances where the compressive strength came in low. Um, not drastically low, but maybe 16 KSI compared to our required 18. And in that case, we went back to the designer and we realized that we can we can live with 16. It's still plenty of compressive strength. So, OK. The biggest you, uh, thing is the steel fiber. That's okay. steel fiber. The clump, the clumping of the fiber. That's that's created quite a few issues. Okay. Uh, do you have any feel for the unit cost uh, per linear foot for a UHP uh, link slab? I don't in that uh, kind of unit. Um, our statewide average for UHPC is ten thousand dollars per cubic yard. So that's. That's the typical cost we see for uh, on a biometric. Uh... Okay, let's say ask a couple of durability questions, and I'm going to get Rick to come in because I think questions are still coming in. Uh, how are the oldest link slabs holding up after 10 years of service compared to conventional decks? They're they're holding up really well. Um, no signs of leakage. No signs of distress. And our oldest one is, it was done in 2013. So yeah, over what? 10 years and um, yeah, it's holding up good. We've, you know, because it was our first one, it's gotten some scrutiny too. There's been some people, you know, third parties and stuff that have gone out and during rainstorms and looked at it and yeah, so far so good. Okay, do you have any feelings at all on the life cycle of a UHBC slab? Might be longer than the concrete that it's next to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that just in general, that's a big question mark um, with UHPC. It hasn't been around long enough. Um, you know, they've done accelerated testing and some extreme environment tests, and everything's panned out really well. But yeah, I mean, if I had to give a number, I'd say at least 50 years. Okay. Have you ever had to remove one yet? No. <laughs> okay. Just wonder how how it would go. Um, usually, when you, you tear the tear the bridge out or something. Um, okay. Um, and what is the performance durability of the UHPC link slab in an environment with heavy use of de-icing salts? I'd say it's it's excellent. I mean, we we use a lot of these de-icing uh, salt and agents in New York State. Um, we have a very low tolerance for icy roads, so we use an incredible amount of uh, salt, road salts, and you know the UHPC material has been holding up really well. And that's also on our 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 joints between precast deck panels, which we've done those since 2009, and um, yeah, they're holding up really well. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Rick. It's getting to be almost 20 yep. after, and maybe he can pick up a few more questions, Rick. Yeah, Jim, um, one question that came in during the Q&A session here was, uh, have you installed 
any instrumentation in the field to monitor or come you know look at the forces and deformations that are that might actually be occurring compared to maybe the calculations and theory side of it no we haven't um that is something that that i would like to do at some point um we're trying to work with a certain university to do that but that uh, that kind of fell through but yeah we haven't done it yet but it, it would be good to, to do that and um, kind of validate our some of our design assumptions sure yeah so the there was some design criteria back in the maybe the 80s um, by a professor in North Carolina have, have you guys used any of that kind of did any of that come into play as you were developing this no no not aware of that okay um, there was a, a couple of, I guess, uh, Paul hit on the cost thing side of things, um, but the um, a comparison on the joint uh, work, I guess, is, I mean, I'm assuming you're doing it because it's uh, give you a long life cycle versus just a straight cost, right? Right. Yeah, this is, this is like a long-term investment, investment. You got to kind of look at, you know, life cycle and, um, you know, the, the advantage of removing the joint, you know, not having to deal with all the maintenance of the joint seal, and then the biggest thing is avoiding the deterioration that that occurs from the leaky joint. So yeah. So there was a uh, reference to a MathCAD sheet. I guess is there any access availability to access that by individuals or? Um, currently, there is not. Um, but we have a, a PDF version that's on our our public website that that someone could look at that PDF and recreate it. But hopefully, um, I'm going to say by the end of the year, uh, we should have all our Lynx Lab information, um, you know, officially approved and, and up on our website. Hmm. Well, that would be great. Um, I guess I'll uh, have got a lot more questions, but uh, we're running out of time here. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Adarod and uh, we'll wrap up things here. Thanks, Jim. Great presentation. Thank you, Thank you Paul. It was a very uh, informative presentation, uh, very comprehensive. Uh, it was very impressive. And certainly at New York State DOT, you guys have lots of uh, data to, to back off the, basically the, your design approach. So we really appreciate the presentation that you get. And on that note, we are going to end our uh, April 2024 webinar. Again, the deadline for submitting the abstract for the 2024 World Bridge Engineering Conference that's going to be held in December 13, 14, and uh, I'm sorry, that's going to be December 11, 12, and 13. That title is wrong. It's December 11, 12, and 13. Um, it's going to be uh, May 30. So the deadline to submit your abstracts is. Um, May 30, so please, uh, if you have an interesting projects, submit it, submit the abstract. Uh, there is a line of keynote speakers that you saw that we have lined up for the conference, so it's going to be very exciting and very informative uh, conference. So on that note, uh, we'll end the conference, we'll end the webinar, and appreciate your participation, and hope to have you with us next month. Thank you.